Today's reading is from uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queens of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, I said, he said, unless someone else explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is a passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not reopen his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As he traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Amen. May God add his blessing to his word. Thank you very much indeed, Irene. Let's uh, pray together before we delve into God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've been reading your living word and we thank you for this man who was interested in your word but didn't understand it. We thank you, Lord, that it is our privilege today to be able to unpack the words of Scripture and to share it together and to understand it with the help of your Holy Spirit. So we pray, Lord, that both in heart and in mind, you would uncover and reveal your word to each one of us so that we may be changed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our young friend this morning, Andrew, uh, was born in the Ivory Coast in Africa. And despite not having ever been to Africa myself, I have a great love for the continent. When I was a boy, my uncle, my mum's younger brother, and his family went out to work and lived in Zambia for a number of years. And my sister-in-law comes from Eritrea in North Africa. As a child, she had a serious fall, an accident. So her Muslim family brought her to the UK for medical treatment, and it was sadly unsuccessful. But she was later given up for adoption and brought up by a family in Edinburgh. And it was there she converted to Christianity. She didn't know it, but as she traveled from North Africa as a young girl with her family, God was searching for her and watching over her life. In our Bible passage today, we also heard about someone from North Africa and as well connected as they come. He was the, the Rachel Reeves of his day in Ethiopia, the chancellor of the exchequer, the treasurer to the queen of ancient Ethiopia. He was a man of great authority and responsibility and also ability. And yet something was missing in his life. 
He was dissatisfied with his position. He was dissatisfied with his wealth. He was searching for truth. And I wonder if that's us this morning. I wonder if that's you this morning. That there is a, that there's a hole, there's an emptiness in your life. Despite your job, maybe, or your wealth, your investments, maybe your health and your family and your connections, you think there must be more to life than this. Maybe like the Ethiopian chancellor, you've come to church this morning to worship, seeking meaning, seeking satisfaction, seeking for God. This morning, we're going to discover that while we might be on a search for God ourselves. There's an even more remarkable and wonderful truth that God is searching for each one of us. The first thing I want to, us to see in this passage is that this man was on a search for God himself. What drove this Ethiopian to search for God? Well, perhaps Jews from North Africa had gone uh, to on the day of Pentecost and heard the Apostle Peter preaching on that day in Acts chapter 2. You can read it for yourself. And maybe they brought that good news about Jesus back to North Africa. This man Jesus, who healed the sick, who calmed the storm, who made the blind see, who touched the leper, who raised the dead. Perhaps the Chancellor thought, I'm going to Jerusalem to see and hear about this man, to see where it all started. And I imagine he would approach his boss, the Queen. Excuse me, Your Majesty, would you please grant me a few weeks annual leave? Where are you going? Well, I want to go to the temple in Jerusalem to visit it. I've heard the people there worship the true and the living God, and I desperately want to meet him. And because the Queen highly regarded this employee, she gave him the, the okay, the thumbs up. Off you go perhaps a few weeks, maybe in a few months. So he jumps on his chariot and with the entourage of soldiers and servants, because he's a, a well-connected man, he sets off on the 200 mile journey north. And when he arrives in Jerusalem, this is one of the sights that he would have seen in front of him. Astonished at the majestic grandeur of the temple. I know some of you have been to Jerusalem and have seen the temple and have seen the wall uh, and I've seen the city in all its majesty. But this man, he wanted to go further. It wasn't just the building he was interested in. And as he approaches the temple, he gets ready to go in to meet God. And his sense of expectation is palpable. His heart's beating. He's thinking, I'm just about there. God is going to reveal himself to me. But he's stopped at the main entrance by the temple guards. Who are you? And where do you come from? I'm the Chancellor of Ethiopia. I look after the Queen's finances. And from a very young age, I was prepared for that role. I was made a eunuch so I could serve the Queen. At that point, the guards stood upright. You can't come in. No eunuchs are permitted in the temple. It's the rule. It's the law of Moses. I'm sure you'll all know that a eunuch is someone who's had an operation, particularly as a child, so that he can't father children, often in preparation for an important religious or political role. And in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, in Deuteronomy 23 verse 1, the religious law says that eunuchs, like many other groups listed, weren't allowed into the temple. Now, this wasn't a a random law of discrimination, a big push out, a hands up, you can't come and meet with God. It had a specific purpose. It was to teach everybody what God was really like. What do I mean by that? Well, if I was to ask you, what do you think God is like? What image do you have in your mind? What would you say if I was to ask you, what is God like? You know, the Bible is God's particular revelation about himself. And when we read it, we discover who God is. In it, we see there's, a one, there's one God, as we've been considering already with the baptism. One God in three persons. God the Father, 
God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, the mystery of the Trinity, as we call it in Christianity. And we learn in the Bible that God is eternal. We are time-bound, we are fallible, we are human, but God is eternal. He's always existed from eternity past and he'll always exist to eternity future. He has no beginning and no end. The Bible calls Jesus the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's all-powerful. He can do all things. God sees all things. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He's everywhere at once, omnipresent is the word that it's given. He never changes. He's so faithful. He's so reliable. He's so dependable. God is eternally loving. He's not like my love, which is fragile and comes and goes. God is dependable. God is faithful. God is eternally loving. And here's the thing. God in his character is completely holy. Completely holy. God has never sinned. God is totally pure. Now, if we are to get to know a God like that, then we must be made holy too. We couldn't just step right in and say, hi God, that would be presumptuous. That would lack humility. God wants us to come to get to know him, but we must be made holy first. And the Old Testament law, if, it, if we're to sum it up, God is saying, if you want to come near to me, you must be made whole again. No sin, no blamelessness, no blemishes, no fault. To go back to our story, I can hear the temple guard saying, I'm sorry, you can't come in, Ethiopian chancellor. You're not the person you were created to be. And we can imagine the, the sadness and dejection as he turns and walks away. What a long journey home to face, not having found what he was looking for. He'd longed to meet with God. He'd longed to be near to him. He was so close, but his condition stopped him from going in. A wasted journey, or so he thought. Maybe you and I have got the same longing to meet with God. Maybe we want to know him better, to, to pray to him, to feel that connectedness. Maybe we've never done before, or maybe we had, but we want to rediscover it again. To have the assurance that, that we are right with God and that we have a place in heaven with him. And you think to yourself, but I'm not the person God made me to be. You know, there are things, David, and I can say this too, there are things in my life that you wouldn't want to know about. There are things I want to be buried in the past. There are things that I'm ashamed of. You know, we're all like that. There's not one of us can say I'm perfect. Not one of us can say I'm right with God. We are sinful and we are broken people. So how then can we worship this loving, majestic, powerful and holy God? Well, we'll come on to that in a moment. It was time for the Ethiopian to head home. And I wonder if he bought it as a souvenir on his trip, a copy of the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And as he's riding along on his chariot on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza, yes, that same Gaza as we've seen in our news, he unfurls the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he's reading. His spiritual hunger isn't satisfied and he starts to read the prophet aloud. I wonder if you're searching for meaning this morning. Maybe you're like the, the top tennis player. You remember her, Chris Everett Lloyd, the 1970s or the 1980s? When she was about to retire, she was terrified. She said, I, I had no idea who I was or what I could be away from tennis. It was my life. I was depressed and afraid because so much of my life had been defined by being a tennis champion. I was completely lost, completely at sea. Or maybe you have a deep interest in the Christian faith. You love coming to church, but, but there's still an emptiness within. 
There are things in your life that have happened that have made you feel a sense of grief. There's a sense of loss. And it's made you disorientated and, and now you have a lack of purpose and deep meaning in your life. You feel alone. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was devoted to God. He preached and he prayed and he even went on a mission to America. And yet despite Wesley's religious zeal, there was a deep void in his life. He lacked peace and assurance of salvation. Returning to Britain, he was completely disheartened and he wrote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but who will convert me? Then one day, everything changed in Wesley's life. Reluctantly, he attended a church service in London when he heard the speaker describing salvation through faith in Christ alone. And Wesley said, my heart was strangely warmed that night. And he realised that salvation wasn't earned by his religious duties or by good efforts, but received through faith in Christ alone. And for the first time in his life, he trusted in Christ and he had peace and assurance. Friends, today we can be greatly encouraged because in our search for meaning and for God, there is wonderful news. God is searching for us. God is searching for you. What happens next to the Ethiopian is what I call a God moment. You see, there are three means by which God finds this man. He uses the Spirit of God to lead a person of God to share the Word of God and to explain the Word of God to him. And you'll hear these three things pretty much in every Christian story, every testimony. You've heard Andrew's and his is the same. Philip is the man of God in this story. He was an outstanding deacon serving the church in Jerusalem and he's also an evangelist. He loved telling people about his faith in Christ. And we're told in Acts chapter 6 that Philip is full of the Holy Spirit. He's full of spiritual qualities like love, joy, peace, gentleness, humility, kindness. Philip is surrendered to the Spirit's guidance in his life. And Philip is having an incredible time. He's telling thousands of people in Samaria about Jesus. Revival is happening. Revival's underway. Many people are coming into the kingdom. Many people are confessing Christ as Lord. And yet the Spirit of God prompts him to leave Samaria and the revival and head to the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. The same Gaza to meet the Chancellor of Ethiopia. You know, Friends, God loves us all, but he deeply loves and values each human soul. Yes, he's interested in the crowds, but he's also interested in each individual person here today. He sought out the Ethiopian, he sought out Andrew, and he is seeking each one of us. And here's something for all who are following Christ to take on board. Am I available? Am I ready? To go where God asks me and to speak to whoever he tells me, however maybe crazy and uncomfortable that might seem. Notice what happens next. The Spirit told Philip to go to the chariot and to stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the, the, the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip says to him. How can I, says the Ethiopian, unless someone explains it to me? So he invites Philip to get on board and to sit with them. It's textbook Hitch a Ride. The eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. The man is, is intrigued. Philip, please tell me, who is this lamb who was silently killed and deprived of justice? Is Isaiah speaking of himself or is he speaking of someone else? So beginning at that very passage, Isaiah 53, Philip told him and explained the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ that has changed and transformed the world since 2000 years ago. Philip explained that Isaiah's words written 700 years earlier were all about Jesus. 
Have you heard of Jesus? Says Philip. Yes, I've heard about him, says the Ethiopian, but please tell me more. Well, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he lived a perfect life for 33 years, but he was cruelly taken by wicked men and crucified on a Roman cross, his hands and his feet nailed to the wood. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was tortured, and a crown of thorns was placed upon his head and he was left there to die. And as he hung there, Jesus was just like a sheep being slaughtered. You know, God could have stayed remote in heaven. He could have stayed there, but he came searching for each one of us. He came into our world on that first Christmas that we'll celebrate just in a few weeks' time and accomplish the Easter story to die as Isaiah prophesied. And in his death, Jesus was accomplishing God's plan of salvation. And during those three hours of darkness, as Jesus hung on that cross, Jesus took upon himself all the sin, all the evil, all the moral failure of the whole human race. And Isaiah 53 verse 5 says this, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, for our wrongs. My sin and my defiance against God were laid on him. Your sin taken by Jesus, the greatest act of love in all of history. Jesus died that we would have forgiveness for our sin and to be reconciled with that holy God that we spoke about earlier. So that we would know God personally and completely in Christ. Philip goes on. Three days later, he would have explained, this Jesus who had died and went into the tomb was raised from the dead with triumph and power. And that's how much Jesus has given for us. And Jesus gives us eternal life, the life that Jesus has now through his resurrection. He gives us that eternal life. I find this absolutely thrilling. It's so exciting. The mighty God who is so vast the universe can, can't contain him sets his love upon one man, that Ethiopian. Sets his love upon me. Sets his love upon Andrew. Each one of us here today. That's how precious each one of us is to Christ. Then I can imagine Philip saying to the eunuch, just unroll your scroll a, bit, a little bit more. Isaiah 53 down to 54, 55, and he gets to Isaiah 56. And this is what he reads in verse four. This is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who choose what pleases me. To them, I will give within my temple a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. The eunuch search is over. He has found Jesus. Who, he was, who was actually searching for him all the time. The Jesus who chose him, the Jesus who loved him and gives him eternal life and a place in his family. What else can he do but devote his life to Jesus Christ? Just like Andrew, the way he showed that, showed his new faith was genuine, was by being baptised. And so as they travel along that desert road, there was a, probably a pool a watering hole, a wadi. What an unusual place to stop. And as his chariot comes past, he says, stop, we're going to get out. And Philip, would you please baptise me? What, what is stopping you to baptise me? And that's exactly what happens. And I'm reminded of, the, of Andrew's mum, Orly. What an unusual place to be baptised, Orly. Baptised in the Grange River at Grangemouth four or five years ago. Who would have expected that, eh? In the middle of a, a town like Grangemouth. God can do amazing things. God changes lives. God brings us to himself. And God asks us to, to show that, show that commitment in the way we live and even through baptism. A few years ago, Liz and I visited St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And the memorable thing about our visit wasn't the magnificent architecture, but Holman Hunt's masterpiece painting, The Light of the World, in the North Transept. It's a picture of a door and outside the door is Jesus knocking, searching. And there's one striking thing about the door. The handle is on the inside. 
the handles on the inside. And it's an invitation for each one of us to do what the eunuch did, to do what Andrew has done, to end our search for God and to invite Jesus into our life. No wonder the Ethiopian in verse 39 says he went in his way rejoicing. His search for God had been completed. And it's my prayer that each one of us here today will be full of joy knowing that we are deeply loved by Christ and that we're welcome and forgiven by him. Let's pray together. If you would like to pray this prayer with me, it's a prayer of commitment to Christ. And maybe you haven't done this before, uh, or maybe you would like to recommit yourself to the Lord. Maybe you've been searching for God and you've realized that God was looking for you all the time in Jesus Christ. Here's your opportunity to, to make your commitment to the Savior. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your love. Thank you for searching for me and finding me. I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything I know that is wrong. I believe that you are, Jesus, the Son of God. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins so that I can be forgiven and for rising again to give me eternal life. Lord, I open the door of my life to you as my Saviour. And I commit to following you as my Lord from this day forward. Please fill me now by your Spirit and be with me forever and help me live the life that you want me to. Amen. Amen.